views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight, it's the debate for the Democratic primary in the 34th Senatorial District, a district that includes Riverdale, Van Cortland Village, Pelham Parkway, City Island, Throgs Neck, and Hunts Point. We have with us the two Democratic candidates who will be on the ballot in the Thursday, September 13th primary. They are Jeffrey Klein. Senator Klein is the incumbent who was first elected to the state Senate in 2004, and he's currently the deputy Democratic leader for the Senate Democratic Conference. Alessandra Biaggi is the challenger in this race. She served in Governor Cuomo's office, focusing on the state's women's policy agenda, and was the deputy national operations director for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Tonight's debate is co-sponsored by the Bronx Times and also the League of Women Voters a nonpartisan political organization that advocates for informed and active participation in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. We're thrilled to have them on board. The primary election, as I said, is Thursday, September 13th. All eligible voters are encouraged to vote. Candidates, thank you for joining us in tonight's debate. I will direct the question to one candidate. That candidate will respond, and then we'll have a free-flowing dialogue with the original respondent having the final say on the question before the next question is asked. At the end of the program, each candidate will be given the opportunity to deliver a one-minute closing statement. Please note, tonight's questions include those that were submitted by the candidates themselves. By prior agreement, the first question will be directed to you. Senator Klein, nice to have you with us, sir. Senator, there's no mistaking it, the elephant in this room is your creation and leadership of the Independent Democratic Conference and then this year's disbandoning of that party. Do you view it as a successful venture in achieving the stated goals of getting progressive legislation passed? And if so, why disband it? Also, it, it must be noted, IDC accounts, which were ruled to be illegal, have not been shut down. So what's the plan for the money? Some speculate that even after November, you're going to reform the IDC. On the table, the IDC. Well, uh, Gary, first you have to go uh, to the beginning, why I decided to run for the state senate in the first place. Uh, when I ran for the state senate in 2004, uh, I won a seat uh, that was a Republican seat for over 50 years. I uh, rolled up my sleeves after I won and fought to win a Democratic majority as head of the Senate Democratic Campaign Committee. Uh, the minute we won that majority, uh, it was all downhill. Uh, corruption, uh, dysfunction, uh, the Brennan Center, a good government group, uh, said that the New York State Senate at the time was the most dysfunctional body uh, in, New in actually in the United States. Uh, so after the election was over and the Democrats lost the majority, we were only majority for two years, uh, I formed the Independent Democratic Conference. Uh, I refuse to be defined as a Democrat or as a state senator uh, by the likes of Carl Kruger, Pedro Espada, or John Sampson, who are all in jail right now. Uh, and I uh, pushed forward uh, a legislative agenda with three other colleagues. Uh, and over the years, uh, we got an awful lot done. Uh, we were able to raise the age of criminal responsibility, $15 minimum wage, the SAFE Act, uh, the toughest, most comprehensive gun law in the nation. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, but just the same, uh, as at the time, it was important to have the Independent Democratic Conference. With the election of Donald Trump, we hit a brick wall. Uh, we find ourselves in the state of New York uh, fighting national policies that hurt New Yorkers, uh, whether it's a woman's right to choose, uh, the lack of a comprehensive immigration policy, or a tax policy uh, that actually hurts the middle class. So we disbanded the Independent Democratic Conference. Uh, we now have 31 uh, duly elected Democrats in one conference. As you said, I'm the deputy minority leader. Uh, and I guess the part two to that question uh, is the uh, Senate Independence Campaign Committee account. Uh, when uh, I first formed the committee, uh, there was an independent Democratic conference. 
Uh, we used that money, I'm very proud, two years ago uh, to elect the first Dominican woman to the state senator, the state senate, Marisol Alcantara from Washington Heights. Uh, and uh, then when we disbanded the IDC, uh, the committee uh, was taken over by the Independence Party. Uh, we actually had a decision uh, that was rendered by a judge that in no way said we had to return the money. Uh, it was very clear. The decision said reconstitute the committee. Uh, anyone who is involved in the Senate Independence Campaign Committee uh, has to be a duly registered uh, member of the Independence Party. Frank McKay, uh, the Independence Party chair, is uh, now the head of the committee. So and now it's up to <coughs> them to determine whether they want to support candidates in primaries or general elections uh, who have the Independence Before Party. Before we let Ms. Biagi in, just to be clear, so your plan is to not reform the IDC? Absolutely not. I'm the future. deputy minority leader, and I'm going to fight for a Democratic majority and hopefully become the deputy majority leader. Uh, I assume you have something to say about what you've heard. So first I just want to start by saying that the Independent Democratic Conference for the past seven years has blocked progressive legislation in, in mass. So things like the Reproductive Health Act, the Comprehensive Contraceptive Coverage Act, GENDA, um, it has seeped into fully funding our public schools, into affordable housing. So it has been uh, a construct that has not only taken away the Democratic majority in New York State for seven years, but it has prevented progress for not only people in District 34, but all New Yorkers across New York State. It is no surprise that, I mean, my opponent mentions the Brennan Center. So that report actually was written prior to him being in the State Senate. And had it been rewritten during his tenure, there would have been an entire chapter on the IDC. The main point of that report was that <laughs> campaign finance reform is incredibly important. And I am unfortunately sitting next to somebody who has been beholden to special interests, who has benefited from special interests, and who, if had been triumphant in campaign finance reform, actually would have not benefited from his, in his campaign accounts. And so I actually very much dispute that argument that it was needed to get things done. Ms. Senator? Well, first of all, uh, since my opponent uh, started her campaign in January, uh, she's been peddling this false narrative uh, that somehow I empowered or made a Republican majority, which isn't true, uh, and I blocked progressive legislation. Uh, first and foremost, over the last four years, as we can see now, the 32nd vote uh, that gave the Republicans the majority uh, is Simka Felder from Brooklyn. Uh, that's why we're 31 Democrats right now in the Democratic Conference, uh, unable to get all of these things done. Uh, so I think we really need a civics lesson. Uh, first of all, you need 32 votes to make a majority leader. The Republicans have 32 votes. That's why John Flanagan is the majority leader. You need 32 votes to pass a bill. Uh, the Reproductive Health Act and all the other great pieces of legislation only have 31 votes. So the way we get those things done, elect more Democrats and beat Republicans. You want to respond to that? And then we'll give you the final word, and then we'll move on. So again, <coughs> in 2012, when the Democrats had 33 seats, um, my opponent decided instead of voting for Senator Stuart Cousins to be the majority leader, who would have been the first woman, the first black woman to lead a majority conference, he voted to put as a, as a leader Dean Skelos, who is a Republican, anti-choice person, who is now on his way to prison. And so that is not of the likings of somebody who cares about a Democratic majority, who cares to ensure that it's, it sustains as a Democratic majority. And I want to just make one point, too, on the independent money as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have taught civics, actually, for many, many, many months. And also, I am an attorney. And so I know it's been a very long time since my opponent has been in law school, but the word illegal means against the law. And so anything that is deemed to be raised illegally, which is what the independent money has been deemed, needs to be returned. It is part of the <laughs> it is part and parcel of being an elected that you abide by the laws. Senator, you get the final word and then we'll move on. Sure, going back again, uh, uh, my opponent is fa really it's fast and loose with the numbers. Uh, 32 is 32, uh, and that's what you need uh, to have a majority. Uh, every single piece of legislation, uh, the Reproductive Health Act, Comprehensive Care, Campaign Finance Reform, need 32 votes, uh, which are lacking right now. And they were lacking four years ago, six years ago. Uh, I've been in the Senate now uh, for 13 years. We never had 32 duly elected senators, let alone Democrats, uh, that would vote 
to codify Roe v. Wade. And by the way, legal decisions, read a decision. Uh, I hope my opponent knows how to read a decision because the decision is very clear. It never said return any money. It never said do anything else other than reconstitute the committee. Ms. Biagi, no one could argue that Senator Klein has delivered for his constituents. Mm -hmm. He has funded programs for education, for seniors, for rent relief, for numerous local groups and organizations. And if you ask them, they say they couldn't survive without his support. How can you, who have not served in elected office before, possibly compete with his experience and have the kind of clout necessary to do a better job delivering for constituents of the 34th Senatorial District? So I love this question. Uh, well. I certainly do not have experience in powering Trump Republicans. I certainly do not have experience running as a Democrat, being elected by all of the voters in District 34 as a Democrat, and then going to Albany and caucusing and empowering Republicans. And I certainly don't have experience blocking legislation after legislation that could actually benefit not only the people in District 34, but all of New York State. Um, I am an attorney. I have worked in Albany twice, first as the Assistant General Counsel for the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, helping to be rebuild New York after Hurricane Sandy, overseeing the Small Business Program, Community Reconstruction Program, and the Infrastructure Program that benefited families and people across all of New York State. I was Secretary Clinton's Deputy National Operations Director. I managed a budget of $500 million in 38 state directors. And then after that election, unfortunately we lost that election, I taught civics in people's living rooms. For four months, I went around the state teaching about why it's so important to not only be civically engaged, but to figure out what your ritual of democracy is. And then after that, I had the opportunity to join Governor Cuomo's executive chamber in his counsel's office. And as an, as an attorney at this time, I saw this as one of the best opportunities that I could use my law degree to fight back against Donald Trump. Except that, as soon as I got there, none of the bills that I was working on were passing in the state Senate. And that was because of the Independent Democratic Conference. In addition to that, my relationships, both in the legislature, in the agencies, and in the executive, are very strong. I intend to lean on them. And I am fourth generation in District 34. It is a place that I love. And I intend to represent it uh, by putting the people's interests first. Senator? Well, first of all, I think uh, my accomplishments speak for themselves locally. Uh, it's because I have a real connection uh, to uh, the Bronx. Uh, born and raised, educated in Bronx public schools, uh, my opponent has absolutely no connection to the Bronx, uh, other than she used to visit her grandfather and swim in his indoor pool uh, in Riverdale. So with that being said, <laughs> I'm very proud of the fact uh, that over the years, uh, my connection to my district enabled me to fight gun violence. Uh, I put together a program called the SUV, uh, which reduced gun violence uh, throughout the precincts in the Bronx by 65%. Uh, started a program called Project Boost, uh, which uh, made sure we had after-school programs uh, and music and art programs. Uh, I started a Bronx Hire program, and one of the offshoots was Bronx Survivor Program. We made sure that survivors of domestic violence uh, got meaningful jobs, financial security, so they can leave their abuser and raise their family and start a new life. Uh, you get the final word here. So I actually never swam in that pool, but uh, my grandparents did live in Riverdale. I came of age in the Bronx. I was born in Mount Vernon, and just for a little bit of, of a lesson on what the district comprises, so the district actually also includes Mount Vernon and Pelham. It's not just the Bronx. It's actually an entirety of these neighborhoods. And so I was born in Mount Vernon, I was raised in Pelham, and I came of age in the Bronx. The streets of Mashaloo Parkway and Henry Hudson Park is where I learned to, to ride my bike. It is the place where I came of age with my cousins and chased after the Mr. Softy truck. It is home to me. And so I will not let my opponent disparage that part of my history. Um, that said, all of my experience has been to give back to the community, the entire community, whether it's the Bronx, whether it's Westchester, whether it's upstate New York, whether it's Long Island. My experience in public service and in government, it comprises all of New York State. Uh, Senator, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's stunning primary victory over Joe Crowley has unleashed a national dialogue over the viability of spending for social programs like health care and education, as well as shifting the party nationally, and there certainly is dialogue about it here in the Bronx and in the state, uh, moving it toward the left, specifically in the name of democratic socialism. Do you support this movement? I'm a Democrat. I'm not a socialist. Uh, but I think uh, the energy uh, around certain issues uh, is extremely important. Uh, I think we need a single-payer health program in New York State. Uh, I think the bill that's out there right now 
uh, is not comprehensive enough, but I think we need to figure out a way uh, that people uh, of all income levels uh, have affordable health care. Uh, and that's why in the Bronx, uh, in the meantime, uh, I started a women's wellness program uh, that's been up and running now for several years. Exercise, healthy eating uh, really has made a real difference uh, in women's lives. We also have a senior wellness program uh, operating in our community uh, to make sure that our seniors uh, are eating healthy, exercising, and living longer. So I think, you know, the combination of these two issues I think are important. I think the energy uh, around Democrats is good. Uh, but I think at the same time, we as Democrats sort of have an opportunity to redefine ourselves. Are we going to be big tent Democrats? Are we going to be diverse? Uh, that's how we beat Republicans, with a message with re that resonates for all. M maybe it's just the label. Aren't these so the, the programs you mentioned, aren't these socialist programs? Well, again, a Democrat is a Democrat. I'm a Democrat, a lifelong Democrat. Uh, I fight for union issues. I fight for seniors. I fight for women's issues. Uh, socialist is something completely different. You have a response to that? So I'm also a Democrat. Um, I think my opponent would probably love if I was a socialist. It would make his life a lot easier. Um, but similarly, um, this may be one of the points that we agree on. I think that we are at a crucial crossroads right now where we have the opportunity to not only take in all of the energy since 2016, but now all of the energy since June 26th and ensure that every single person is part of the democratic process in a way that makes the Democratic Party inclusive, not opaque has how it's usually been. You want to have a final word or we'll just move on? I can move on. Thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Biagi, Mayor de Blasio has proposed building 90 new homeless shelters. Do you support the proposal? And if so, where would you place homeless shelters in the 34th Senatorial District? So I, I first want to actually address this issue from a bigger perspective. Homelessness is a massive problem in New York City. And a part of that problem is in the Bronx, in Pelham Parkway and the eastern part of the district. It is incredibly important to note that a lot of homeless people are also people who have full-time jobs, who have no access to affordable housing. And so while it is important to have homeless shelters, I think that we need to look at the way that homeless shelters have been distributed amongst the five boroughs and not just continue to add homeless shelters only in the Bronx. That said, um, my opponent is someone who during his tenure, we have lost 95,000 rent stabilized units. So that is housing for 300,000 people. A lot of people are homeless, not only because they can't afford to pay their education costs or their mortgages or their rents or their health care, but because housing prices in New York are soaring in a way that makes it almost impossible for people to stay in their homes, for people to stay in the neighborhoods that they love. And so, Homeless shelters are an important piece of this, and we have to actually incorporate the community in this discussion, and it cannot only be in the Bronx. I, I opposed uh, every single one of uh, Mayor de Blasio's homeless shelters uh, that was cited uh, within my district uh, and with a lot of community support. Uh, we defeated one in Soundview. Uh, we defeated one in the Bruckner Boulevard, uh, the uh, Throgneck section of the Bronx. Uh, and I think the answer is, uh, more housing. Uh, that's why I'm very proud of the fact that I recreated uh, the Mitchell-Lama program uh, with a hundred and fifty million dollar middle-class tax credit. Uh, we're going to be able to build thousands of units of real affordable housing uh, for the middle class. I also support the Home Stability Support Program, uh, which would increase the voucher amount to keep people in their homes before they get evicted. You know, I think uh, that's what we need to do. And also, we need to preserve our NYCHA housing stock, New York City Housing Authority stock. Uh, I made sure $500 million and a state independent monitor was put in place uh, to make sure NYCHA residents uh, have the living conditions they deserve. Uh, you want to get a final word there? Yes, I do. So I hear a lot about um, the things that, that my opponent has done, except that there are four critical things that the state Senate could have done that have not been done. Closing the loopholes in vacancy decontrol, in preferential rent, and in eviction bonuses. Ensuring that we repeal the Erdstadt law so that our rent stabilized uh, guidelines can be set by New York City and not by Albany. These are the critical pieces of legislation that can improve the lives of people in District 34 and across the entire state. I do not walk four feet without hearing from somebody that they can not only not afford their homes, but that their rent is going up, that 
people knock on their doors and tell them that, oh, they need improvements to be made, and then, ma and then major capital improvements get made in these people's homes who are living paycheck to paycheck. And just a note here, landlords who make these MCI improvements are not required to provide a receipt this is robbery on people who are working families in this district. These are the things that the state Senate needs to focus on. It's all well and good to create these, these housing programs or these housing facilities, but without the laws to protect the people who live inside those four walls, we're not doing much. I but support all those issues, by the way, as far as uh, all of the rent regulation issues. But again, once again, uh, the votes aren't there. Uh, so in the meantime, I have a full-time lawyer uh, in my office uh, that fights for tenants every day. Uh, we brought a lawsuit. Uh, against the landlord in Pelham Park. We own four buildings and got a rent rollback for hundreds and hundreds of tenants in that building. Uh, that's what it's about. Uh, it's protecting tenants and making sure they have the ability uh, to live in a decent environment. You get the yes, final word. I would, I would just like to say something about this. Let's move on quickly to get to the next one. That sounds great, except in practice what's really happening is my opponent is taking money from the real estate special interests in such a way that it makes it very challenging to actually make those laws that I just mentioned something that are priorities for himself and for his independent democratic conference members. And so special interests are leading his legislative agenda in a way that we have seen for seven years. These are bills that could have been brought to the floor for a vote. These are bills that we could have made sure were passed. Just because, by the, I have to actually make, this is a really important point, simply because we have um, 31 Democrats and 32 Republicans, there are Republicans who will vote yes on some of these things. So the real challenge is actually to get these bills to Let the floor for a vote. Let me know who they are, I, I, <laughs> because they haven't done so thus well, far. I've worked with some I, of I, them. I want to get one, one question in, I'm sure there's <laughs> ongoing disagreement about that, but I want to I get one question in, uh, because many people conceive of this district as being Riverdale and, and the East Bronx, but the fact is it goes all the way down south to Hunts Point. Mm -hmm. Um, the Bruckner, and so we'll, we'll ask you and you both can weigh in, the Bruckner and Sheridan Expressways are about to get a $1.7 billion upgrade. Many officials are enthusiastically endorsing the plan, but residents and the Municipal Arts Society, which filed scathing comments on the draft EIS, say that the new ramps for Edgewater Road will be a disaster for residents, increase trucks in their communities, and they abhor the idea of sacrificing some of the concrete plant, park plant. Um, what, what do you recommend? Well, first of all, that uh, $1.5 billion uh, was done uh, after a study uh, that myself and Assemblyman Marcos Crespo funded in last year's budget uh, for a million dollars came to fruition. Uh, this is needed. Uh, the Sharon Expressway needs to have a major change, a major overhaul. What you're talking about, though, is I support the plan uh, that these groups are advocating for. Uh, we need not only a new expressway, uh, but access to parks. Uh, and uh, waterways. Uh, that's what we need to do. It shouldn't be just fixing a roadway. It's gaining access to parks, and that's something that I was able to accomplish. You want to sure. Respond? So I think the bigger issue is transportation generally, and I think that in District 34, we are there are parts of the district that are transportation deserts. And so not only do we have an MTA crisis with our subways, um, we don't have, <laughs> we have not found the money to be able to ensure that the systems that are in place are going to be with be able to withstand the traffic that's on them. And so we are disrupting people's lives. I am in favor of making people's lives when it comes to transportation better because these are things that not only allow people to get to and from work, but they improve the community's access in and out. However, that said, I think that we have to always listen to the community and what the community wants. I could more just jump in word. on that, absolutely. Sure. Because uh, one of the things we were able to do in this budget, uh, past budget, was $840 million uh, for repairs to the uh, subway system. And at the same time, I'm very proud of the fact that I advocated and succeeded uh, in making sure that we're going to get four new Metro North stations in the Bronx. Uh, three of them happen to be in the 34th Senate District, Hunts That's Point, uh, Park Chester, and Morris Park. We're going to allow people to get into Manhattan in 18 minutes instead of an hour. Uh, that's meeting transportation needs uh, of the Bronx. We've got time for like a yes or no thing here. So I'm going to throw out, speaking of transportation, the city wants to narrow Morris Park Avenue, a so-called road diet plan to fit in bike lanes. Good idea? Bad idea? <laughs> um, I am in favor of reducing traffic on streets because it, it actually contributes to uh, a climate, quick, our huh? climate. Yes. So the answer is yes, if it doesn't disrupt the traffic. 
Uh, no, uh, the entire community is opposed to it, and I always cite the will of the community. All right. Uh, we've uh, come to the end of our uh, uh, formal uh, debate part of the program. We'll give you, each of you a chance for a one-minute closing statement. And uh, by prior agreement, uh, Senator Klein, you get the first uh, remark. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank BronxNet for once again uh, giving the voters of the 34th Senate District the opportunity uh, to hear myself uh, and my opponent. You know, uh, over the years, uh, I cherish my role uh, as a public servant. Uh, I originally uh, decided to run for the state Senate uh, to make sure we had a Democratic majority. Uh, and over the years, even though there wasn't a Democratic majority, uh, I was able to get a lot of things done. Uh, paid family leave, uh, the most comprehensive program in the country. Uh, and I'm also proud of a lot of the local things we were able to do. Uh, I want to continue to meet the needs of Bronxites, and I hope uh, my contract will be renewed for another two years. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Biagi. Thank you. So I often say that politics is the art of the possible at its best, and government is this transformational vehicle that can be used to make people's lives better. Thank you very much for your service, but I feel that it is time for a change. The future of the Democratic Party is inclusive. It is diverse. It is compassionate. It ensures that if you are electing somebody and you're putting your trust in someone to say that you hope that that person is a Democrat, that they actually are. What I am excited to do is to represent the voters and the people, all of the people of District 34. It is something not to be taken for granted and it is certainly not something 15. to betray the voters' trust on. So thank you very much, Gary. Thank you, thank Senator you. Klein, thank and you, thank Gary. you, uh, Ms. Biagi. Thank we you. appreciate your time today. And candidates, while you might not agree thank on you. everything, I know you will all agree with me that every eligible voter should come out and vote on Thursday, September 13th. Viewers, please note it's a primary election, so only voters enrolled in the Democratic Party in the 34th Senatorial District can vote in this race. Also, we want to thank our co-sponsors, and they are the Bronx Times, and the League of Women Voters. For more information, please call the League at 212-725-3541. Next week, we continue it. will be the candidates in the Democratic primary for the 84th Assembly District. Then on August 27th, it will be the candidates in the Democratic primary for the open seat in the 87th Assembly District. We thank you for watching. We thank our producer, who's Helen Greenberg, our director, William Guzman. Thanks to BronxNet Television that believes wholeheartedly in voter education. And be sure, go out and vote on September 13th. Goodbye.